The colonial issue in Germany was very acute in the second half of the 19th century. That patchwork quilt that Germany had been on the map for many centuries finally merged into a single canvas. The Germans felt like residents of a large and ambitious country, located in the very center of Europe, with access to the sea, developing industry and a strong army. Naturally, sentiments began to spread in the country that Germany occupied an inappropriate place in the hierarchy of European nations, not least due to the lack of colonies. At that time, overseas possessions increased the international prestige of a country and were also considered a source of wealth. Having made great efforts, Germany acquired large colonies in Africa and Oceania in the 80s of the 19th century. It began to be reckoned within the colonial world, so the first point of colonial politics was fulfilled. But what about the other component on which the Germans counted so much? The profit. If you own land of this size, it would seem that it can only bring big money. This, in fact, is one of the main clichés about colonial history. European usurpers pumped out all the resources from their African and Asian colonies and simply squeezed out these lands like a sponge filling their treasury. Supposedly, due to the merciless exploitation of the colonies, the standard of living in Europe increased so significantly in the late 19th century. But Germany had to do a lot of things before making a profit. First, simply attract a sufficient number of colonists. To do this, it was necessary to create acceptable living conditions for them, which meant building infrastructure, roads, hospitals, schools and other non-profitable things. New borders and the colonists themselves had to be protected, so the costs of the army were inevitable. It was necessary to establish the production and export of typical colonial products, such as coffee, cocoa and tobacco. Even if the semi-slave labor of the local population was used, this also required organization, time and investment. Mineral deposits had yet to be found, and then their mining had to be organized as well. All products had to be transported, which meant building railways and ports, which also required investments. Finally, the periodic uprisings of the local population undermined production and demanded even more spending on the army. What happened in the end? The Germans had to develop the infrastructure from scratch, since the lands they captured had not previously been colonized by anyone. Britain and France considered them not particularly promising. Mining only made profit in Namibia, where diamonds were discovered, but this did not happen until 1908. The construction of railways in the colonies did not begin until the end of the 19th century, because the German government hesitated to invest in overseas possessions. Investments in colonies amounted to only about 2% of the total German capital investments. It was difficult to expect a large number of colonists under such conditions. At the beginning of the 20th century, the government began to pay more attention to the colonies. But still, until the outbreak of the First World War, the total number of Germans in all colonies combined did not exceed 25,000 people. Most of them lived in Namibia because of diamond mining. Indeed, this was a normal situation for a country that had recently acquired colonies. The same thing happened, for example, in the Italian colonies in Africa, which were also developed only at the end of the 19th century. Few people wanted to move there. Germany's percentage of imports from its own colonies was even less, about half a percent. The trade was higher even with the colonies of other states, such as Egypt, Morocco and South Africa. Some private companies involved in the sale of agricultural crops could make good profits in the colonies. Still, the lands absorbed much more money than they brought to the state budget. Now let's take a look at the numbers. The link to the source is down below in the description. Let's take diamond-rich Namibia or German Southwest Africa. Almost 35 million marks were spent on this most developed German colony from 1884 to 1912. This includes the administrative costs, costs of the army, the construction and operation of railways, ports, schools, hospitals and so on. A little more than 24 millions were received during the same time, including taxes and tolls. The next one is the largest German colony, East Africa. 
Almost 19 million marks were spent on it during the same time, and 15 and a half were received. 10,950,000 marks were spent on German Cameroon, and a little less was received, 10,330,000. It's remarkable that the smaller the German overseas territory was, the better was its economy. The small colony of Togo brought 3.5 million marks to the budget, at 3,300,000 costs. The same dynamics were observed in the German colonies in Oceania. Small islands could bring profit, although their part in total income and imports was very small. The settlement of Qingdao in China stands apart. From 1897 to 1912, almost 16 million marks were spent on it, with an income of nearly 8 million. But this was rather a military base than a trading colony. The German colonies combined brought in an income of almost 64 million marks, starting from their founding until 1912. At the same time, Germany spent 87 million marks on them. Even after deducting Qingdao's 8 million deficit, it was still a clear loss. You can find numbers that are slightly different from those given in other sources, but the general trend stays the same. The colonies did not bring Germany any profit. Now, to better understand which amounts we are talking about, let's try to recalculate them for today's money. One mark of 1912 in its purchasing power is approximately equal to today's 15 euros. If we would take the mark of the late 19th century, then the difference would be even higher. But even if we stop at the rate of 1 to 15, it turns out that Germany, in almost 30 years, has invested in colonies 1 billion 305 million euros and received a little less than a billion from them. In conclusion, we can say that the economy of the German Empire increased despite the colonies, and not because of them.